overall overall feeling in the country especially the the jailing of uh, chief ministers and former chief ministers and uh, political activists people who dissent mm. and you know, under this regime uh, democratic norms and democratic rights are uh, uh, being suppressed mm-hmm. norms are, are not being uh, uh, followed mm-hmm. so all the things uh, put together make me say that our republic is in crisis especially the republican values i took a pause on the 22nd of january okay because that was the uh, pran pratishtha of ayodhya ram mandir mm-hmm. i wanted to get an idea of what could be the impact of that particular event Hmm. on the electoral performance of the ruling party because you know that was the that was you know the, the, the that was the main thing they were banking on 2014 the prime minister acknowledges the role of all the previous prime ministers and then he also goes on to say that you know what is required today is the is is, is team india and team india he defined that as prime minister and all the chief ministers to completely uh, hinduize our political discourse to me to me that that is the larger mission okay and you know uh, uh, in that in 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 realizing that mission in the pursuit of that mission today if if bjp is 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 uh, instrumental uh, bjp is useful yes if not anybody else Ladies and gentlemen, this is the ABB Life Podcast. Uh, joining me today in conversation is Dr. Parkala Prabhakar. He is a renowned face. Uh, he is a political economist and uh, has been associated with the Indian political ecosystem and have been very vocal about the current government and regime. Welcome to the podcast, sir. How are you doing? I'm very well, Abhi. Thank you very uh, much. I've seen so many of your interviews, and the background remains the same. And that's a beautiful background. So many books, and I'm in <laughs> love with books. each and every time and see them thank you very much i like uh, to spend time here <laughs> agreed that's the best gift anybody can get uh, i got i figured out this book it may look like a mirror image but this is the crooked timber of new india essays on republic in crisis by dr parkala prabhakar why do you think that the republic indian republic is in crisis Oh, Abir, I I dealt with that uh, very elaborately in the book, but uh, just to give you a summary of what that mm-hmm. is, is you see uh, the economy is in shambles, our uh, social fabric is uh, frayed, mm-hmm. you know, the the harmony and the respect for diversity, tolerance, um, you know, of uh, language, religion, region, uh, they these are under strain now. so our social fabric our economy our polity especially the 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 federal principle on which uh, you know our polity is based that is also under strain now because the the central government is uh, riding roughshod over the states especially when it comes to the financial devolution mm-hmm. uh, and then the ruling party goes on talking about the double engine sarkar trying to tell the people in different states that you know if you vote for our party you might better get be, you might get a better deal and if you don't vote for our party you, you will get a raw deal you know in in so many ways and in so many uh, rallies the prime minister and most of the uh, leading uh, uh, personalities of the ruling party have been saying this this is another um, and uh, you know the overall overall feeling in the country especially the the jailing of uh, chief ministers and former chief ministers and uh, political activists people who dissent mm. and you know, under this regime uh, democratic norms and democratic rights are uh, uh, being suppressed mm-hmm. norms are, are not being uh, uh, followed mm-hmm. so all these things uh, put together make me say that our republic is in crisis especially the republican values okay you you were one of the early faces who predicted the exit poll and the result and that to like bang on you suggested that the bjp led government nda that was not the case because the main narrative in the media space or the media ecosystem was that bjp is not winning uh, nda is not winning but the bjp is winning but you predicted that 
that's not going to happen if it happens india will become a dictatorial regime and a lot of other things why do you think that you cracked the code way before anybody could have and why did you think that your analysis was bang on um obir i must say here that i was not bang on I mean, let's get really here okay you know, i, I I I I was saying that uh, you know the BJP is unlike was un, is unlike to cross two hundred thirty, but mm-hmm. it reached two hundred. Right. You know I have gone wrong in two or three places. Okay. One I have gone wrong in Delhi. Mm-hmm. I had gone wrong in Odisha. Hmm. These two places I had gone wrong, and that is mainly the reason why you know there was a difference of about ten seats uh, 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 between what I had given as the upper limit for BJP mm-hmm. and. Uh, actual result mm-hmm. but as you say you know i was uh, somewhere near the ballpark right unlike, unlike all the you know the professional uh, um, pollsters who did the exit polls and who sit in uh, uh, studios like yours you know uh, the, 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 i'm not i'm not trying to find fault with them but you see uh, i'll tell you i mean uh, they, they they must have uh, projected those figures according to their own data agreed yeah But, but you know, I, I'm not trying to find fault with them, or not. I'm not trying to denigrate their professionalism or uh, attribute motives. That's a different ball game altogether. I'm not getting into that. But I'll tell you, you know, why I arrived at those figures. Mm-hmm. You see, I've been traveling uh, all around the country for the last ten to eleven months. Okay. Especially about my book, you know, book discussions, book launches, and you know, my book has already al- also come out in different languages. Mm-hmm. I've been going around, and also the other events. True. And you know, uh, over wherever I went, whenever I went, I made it a point to spend a couple of days more after the event or before the event, and try to contact a cross section of the people. Okay, men, women, youngsters, elderly people, you know, uh, small business people, farmers, and unemployed young people, you know, you know a whole host of because I, I I'm in the I'm I I'm professionally also qualified to you know undertake surveys and uh, opinion polling and market research and other things. I I roughly have an idea. I have except Jammu and Kashmir and Northeast. I have gone to almost every state in the country. Okay, and to some states I had gone to uh, more than once. Okay, three, four times also. So after touring all, uh, you know, uh, the states and talking to people, I've been trying to you know get the opinion of you know what bothers them, what are the things that are. Uh, you know uh, agitating them what are the things that uh, are okay uh, as far as the government is concerned you know I've, i've been generally chatting with people talking to people as i said a cross section of people mm-hmm. and you know i mean not, not very scientifically designed questionnaire and quantitative analysis but you know there is something called qualitative analysis also just a human to human just a human to human conversation and yes, just... yes. and over another thing you know i took i i i took a pause on the 22nd of january okay because that was the uh, pran pratishtha of ayodhya ram mandir mm-hmm. i wanted to get an idea of what could be the impact of that particular event hmm. on the electoral performance of the ruling party because you know that was the that was you know the the, the that was the main thing they were banking on hmm. but did it actually create an impact uh sorry did it actually create an impact No, I was I was waiting for that because I didn't know at that time. Okay. But then I I I I was trying to see you know if if it could have an impact because they were expecting that. Hmm. So I waited for a while. I mean by then I had some kind of an idea of where it was going. But then I I gave a pause as I said uh, you know on twenty uh, second of January. Since then I've been going around, resumed my travels, and I went around and I was trying to locate somebody. Okay. was not a ruling party supporter before 22nd of january okay and on account of 22nd january from thir- 23rd of january they became a supporter of bjp ruling party which means you know that would have indicated a shift True. people who are not with them you know they were getting added to them hmm. but believe me you uh, obir i have not found even single person that on account of 22nd january 
they went over to the bjp who were otherwise not with the bjp mm. you know it it could have it could have consolidated their support base but my point was that you know it it did not add anything to them Hmm. and then uh, the issues like uh, joblessness rural distress and price rise and uh, you know farmer agitation uh, um, um, general economic decline decline in real wages and then you know and, 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 and to to some extent you know, to some people chinese occupation these were the things that were really um, exercising them so oh. so on that basis this is one side Okay. the other one abir uh, if you allow me one more minute yeah sure um, yeah see the other one was is that you know i am in possession of historical data mm -hmm. you know from 1952 onwards what was the uh, percentage of vote pulled by the earlier bharti janata sang and now the bharti janata party you know what was their pitch and what was the kind of uh, um, uh, vote percentage that they got and all that kind of thing so when i looked at that when i looked at this then uh, i also went on uh, looking at the prime minister selection pitch this time mm -hmm. you know like before you must you must understand this many people gloss over this in fact bjp also got confused bjp leadership also got confused you see their their mandate for 2014 and 2019 was not for a hindutva pitch So it was for unemployment. It was for unemployment, voice noise. You know, uh, policy paralysis, corruption, no. uh, the notional loss of a lot of revenue. Two G, um, you know, three G, and then uh, uh, Commonwealth Games and all that kind of thing. And anti-corruption movement was at its peak. Peak. And then that gave them a huge mandate because you see uh, the 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 traditional voter. who are uh, you know who favored uh, liberalization manmohan singh you know uh, his economics and his, his political economy and all that they slowly drifted away from the congress and then went upa and then went to bjp nda mainly because of you know who are these people who went away the middle class the urban the educated the professionals these were the people True. and how were most people really actually uh, uh, you know uh, give less importance to this but electoral bonds had played a huge role people underestimate this you know people think that you know how who will understand electoral bonds you know even i don't understand electoral bonds how can anybody a, a, a common person understand electoral bonds but you see you and i also do not understand what was 2g So you see, the the sense of it that money has changed hands, that there was some shady thing has happened, that has stuck in the minds of the people, and therefore that has happened to the unlettered and the lettered ones also. You know, the 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 moral high ground of BJP that you know, na khaunga na khane dunga. We're against corruption. We will bring back uh, black money. Mm. We'll put uh, money in your uh, bank account. create two crore jobs you know all that when when it was not realized so that section which moved away from upa to nda bjp mm -hmm. has either become hostile or indifferent or less enthusiastic in its support okay. so if you look at uh, you know the the shifting major shifts were taking place in the electoral uh, landscape then so that i could realize that was the reason why i i i said you know it would be about 230 not more than 230 okay makes sense you are also chess player i badly learned that um we, we were talking about dissent there is a, a very common thing in chess a pawn just keep on, keeps on moving 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 until he, it reaches the last stage it becomes mostly a queen which has a lot of power do you think can you draw any parallels in the modern polit political ecosystem where we see a pawn actually re reaching that particular stage and changing the entire political narrative as you are mentioning oh uh, th this is uh, this is a very very interesting uh, way of looking at it and very interesting question of it i must say um, and you relating this to my uh, familiarity 
and enthusiasm for chess. You see, if I mean, I've not thought about it, but since you mentioned this, what occurs to me is that, you know, look at uh, the BJS, Bharti Janssen earlier, and the BJP, and look at their uh, mentor, ideological mentor, hmm. the Rashtra Sivan Sevak Sak. You know, it started like a poem. Very small. You know, they had a narrative. It was not acceptable. A large section of the country, a large part of the country, a large, uh, uh, overwhelmingly large uh, uh, part of the electorate did not, you know, uh, harbor those kind of, uh, or not sympathetic to that kind of a narrative. That India is for Hindus kind of a thing. Mm. But slowly and slowly, you know, uh, uh, one square after the one square after the one square after the slowly and slowly that pawn moved and moved and moved and today you know it's what it is. So if you have to draw an analogy from chessboard and 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 you know look at the Indian polity today, what was uh, a, just a pawn in 1952 is now king or a queen, whatever you prefer. A queen, most powerful, as most you said. Yeah. You, you mentioned in the book that uh, you it's your habit to watch the 15th August speech of all the Prime Minister till date. And you've been following that from ages. Even if you're not in India, even if you're some, uh, somewhere abroad, you uh, make it a discipline to watch the speech. I would love to know your POV, your point of view of uh, Narendra Modi uh, between 2014 and 2024, what has fundamentally changed as a person, as a politician, and overall, what do you think is a significant change in Narendra Modi between 2014 and 2024? Um, that's very interesting. Um, you see, um, in 2014, uh, that was the first uh, uh, independence day speech from the Ramparts right. of Redford right. for Mr. Narendra Modi. But then you have to look at uh, 2014 speech against the background of the 2014 elections and the election pitch. Right. Candidate Modi from 2013 onwards, later part of 2013 onwards, throughout the campaign. What was the pitch? Obviously, the pitch, if you if you if you try to recall. The pitch was that, you know, Hindus, the, the, the fight is not between Hindus and Muslims. The fight is between Hindus and Muslims on the one hand, one side, and uh, unemployment, poverty on the other. That was the pitch. Hmm. And anti-corruption was the pitch. Right. Creation of jobs was the pitch. Elimination of policy paralysis was the pitch. And from that pitch, and Gujarat model, economic development, you know, that kind of a pitch. And that pitch carried on in the mind of the candidate Modi and the, and the Prime Minister Modi mm -hmm. from 19, 2014 uh, Redford uh, address onwards until, say, about 16, probably. Okay. And slowly and slowly that started fading. If you if you notice, 2014, the Prime Minister acknowledges the role of all the previous Prime Ministers, irrespective of the political parties. Hmm. And then he also goes on to say that, you know, what is required today is the is 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 Team India. And Team India he defined that as Prime Minister and all the chief ministers. Okay. And immediately after that, you know, you had uh, Niti Aayog uh, constituted, Niti Aayog, in which there was a, a meeting of all the chief ministers with the prime minister. So it carried on. That spirit carried on. So the, the pitch and the verdict in favor of BJP, uh, NDA and against uh, UP and Congress were understood. So they were carried on. And from 16 onwards, slowly the narrative starts changing. You know, uh, the Prime Minister doesn't talk about uh, any more Team India. Of course, you know, the entire thing started only in 2014. No, no Prime Minister, even even the tallest leader of his own party, Sri Atil Bihari Vajpayee, doesn't figure anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, leave alone the other Prime Ministers belonging to other political parties, forget them. Mm 
and team india becomes not the prime minister and the chief ministers but team india becomes prime minister and 140 crore indians so he and the people not anyone in between mm-hmm. and then and then slowly and slowly even pradhan sevak is dropped mm-hmm. you know 16 17 18 pradhan sevak is dropped and chaukidar is again brought in but dropped you know finally it reaches a crescendo in 2014 where it was not an nda manifesto it was not even a bjp manifesto it is modi guarantee mm-hmm. and then you know uh, 2014 also if you look at the speeches in you know, successive speeches slowly and slowly all the parties dropped and is of course uh, there is there's no mention at all uh, you know eventually uh, all the other prime ministers are also gone chief ministers are also gone um, it's 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 completely his government he and the people that is the tone that has come about and slowly in between also there is there is a very very uh, a clever insertion of hate in the sense um you see in one of the speeches uh, um he talks about uh, uh, the 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 horrors of division mm-hmm. so you know that was uh, some kind of a dog whistle to indicate that you know we we are moving towards uh, othering of a huge a uh, minority in our country that was the first dog whistle right from the ramparts of red fort you know by then a lot of lynching already was taking place a lot of uh, economic calls for economic boycott was taking place even calls for genocide were, uh, were coming out from dharma sansad and things like that and the prime minister himself gives a dog whistle of this this sort so that is the that is how i could see the evolution reflected in the successive speeches of the prime minister of india from the ramparts of red fort on the uh, days of uh, india's independence okay since you were saying this uh, one thing just popped into my head is like now the rss has taken a stand uh, it has spoken extensively about the manipur violence and that everybody it's a election not a fight uh, you should have your own opinion you should have your own ideology it's a fight of ideology but it's not a it shouldn't be violent do you think that there is some kind of a divide between the bjp and the rss or as a lot of people in the media scape and the popular social media have said that this is nothing but just covering up uh, the others mistake how do you see uh, this entire bjp versus rss divide obir that remark by uh, shri mohan bhagwat would have had a lot of uh, credence and credibility hmm. if he had said that before the elections you see manipur started uh, more than one year ago you know may last year may 3rd it started hmm. now you know talking about manipur uh, um, you know today um uh, coming from uh, the sarsang chalak of uh, the rss it mean to, to me it, it's not very serious it, it's just very it, it's it's a some some kind of a, a very safe kind of a posturing that's one and secondly even during the run up if you notice if you recall uh the bjp national president shri nadda then mm. he said you know uh, uh, we are not dependent on uh, RSS. the rss said that hmm. so i do not think these are very serious things that you know we should uh, really spend time on is is there a lift etc but one thing and i must say in this context that uh, you know uh, if you look at the larger mission of the rss hmm. i do not think that rss larger mission is only to keep bjp in power or prop up bjp you know the larger mission if you have to understand of rss 
is to make the Indian polity in support of Hindu Rashtra. Hmm. To, to, in order to Hinduize every political party and the entire leadership, political leadership and entire society, of course. So, in politics especially, you know, if, 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 if BJP is doing their bidding, it's fine. But at the same time, the, 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 the national narrative should be changed in such a way that every political, every political party mm. should speak in this, language, in this language, in this idiom. Even if it's not, not associated with RSS. That, that, yeah, yeah that, that, that is the mission, isn't it? Okay. So, to, 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 to completely uh, Hinduize our political discourse. To me, to me that, that is the larger mission. Okay. And you know, uh, uh, in that, in, 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 in realizing that mission, in the pursuit of that mission, today, if, if BJP is, is, is uh, instrumental, uh, BJP is useful, yes. If not, anybody else. Makes sense. How do you see the next five years of the NDA government now, not the BJP government, but the NDA, NDA government? How do you see the next five years going ahead? It's very interesting, uh, Pavir, uh, since uh, you, you try to differentiate between NDA government and... Agree, BJP yes, government. yes. But you see, uh, there is a very, very clear uh, message embedded in the 2024 verdict. Hmm. That message is this, that, you know, don't drag this country away from its secular, liberal... Uh, tolerant, diverse ideals and values of the Republic. Don't take it away, you know, keep dragging it on to, uh, um, on the trajectory of Hindu Rashtra and one nation, one religion kind of a thing. I, th I think the electorate had uh, stopped that kind of a thing in its tracks and, you know, uh, held the BJP and probably even the Prime Minister by the scruff of his collar and, you know, brought, brought, brought him back, brought the polity back. Now, if you look at what's happening since the verdict has come out, I don't think the BJP, especially the leadership of the BJP, Mr. Narendra Modi and, you know, the top leaders, refuse to, you know, understand and admit to this verdict and the embedded message. They are they're refusing to acknowledge this message. It's the, I, I feel it's because... You see, uh, a mature person, a strong person, a mature organization, a strong organization would admit to vulnerabilities, weaknesses, recognize, acknowledge, and 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 try to you know accommodate things. No, I, I I'm not anymore. Uh, I'm only 240. So let me, you know, be nice to other people. Now the verdict is, uh, you know, a split verdict. It's not just an endorsement of what I've uh, been doing for the last 10 years. It, there is a warning. People will admit that. But an immature leader, like, like, like a kid, no, no, I have not fallen. Nothing has happened. I'm not hurt. This is only a small thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of pretense that nothing has happened, everything is, you know, like before. You know, this is, what else is this other than a pretense? Tell me. Now, if if it goes like this, you know, immediately after the verdict has come out, you have uh, uh, Delhi Lieutenant Governor, Governor giving permission for uh, prosecution of Arendit Roy. And, you know, uh, now what is happening about uh, the Speaker and Deputy Speaker negotiations between the, the ruling party and the, and the opposition parties. Mm -hmm. All these things tell me that the BJP and the BJP's leadership refuses to acknowledge or understand the message that is embedded in the 2024 verdict. Now, if that is the case, they would love to, you know, they would like to, you know, go on in this path. And if they go on in this path, Abir, my fear is that every state in this country probably will become like Manipur. Economy will further deteriorate. Not only that, Repression also will increase because they, they wouldn't like to tolerate this. But 
having said that, I must also say that, you know, uh, I do not see a very smooth ride for this government. I feel that the ride is going to be bumpy. I feel that uh, it will be very, very difficult for Ms. Narendra Modi government, the present government, to cross the flow test. I'm not saying that they won't. Very, very, with a lot of difficulty. It, it's not, it's not a cakewalk. So, they, which means that they will have to mobilize every resource that they have, every political resource and other resources that they have, in order to, you know, muster those numbers and 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 proceed. And you see, you must also keep in mind that Ms. Narendra Modi has never ever run a coalition government. Hmm. And not only that, he has not ever run a party government. It was always, from Gandhinagar to New Delhi, it's always his own government. Right. So he is not in the habit of, you know, um, uh, checking with other people, you know, running uh, ideas by other people, taking instructions or advice. You know, he's not, he's not used to that. Today, the equations have changed. Now you have you are dependent on two very very experienced politicians, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu and Mr. Nitish Kumar. True. Or with these two politicians, I have seen ups and downs. They have seen uh, defeats and victories. Mr. Mr. Modi has not seen uh, defeats. And they are Mr. superheroes Modi in coalition. And they are superheroes of coalition government. Coalition governments and experienced. And, you know, uh, they fell and they rose and they lost and they won again. You know, they're, they're good at uh, deal-making, they're good at uh, negotiations, they're good at, uh, you know, accommodation, they're good at uh, pressing for their demands, you know, all that kind of thing. Look. Now, can you imagine Mr. Narendra Modi or Mr. Shaw every day morning taking, uh, you know, a uh, taking down a list of uh, demands and fulfilling them by the evening or by evening, you know, if, if they're not fulfilled, you know, carrying them over for the next morning. Is it possible for them? I feel those skills are not there in the present government. Okay. Therefore, 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 uh, passing the flow test will be very difficult. If at all they pass, it will be very difficult for Mr. Modi and his team to run this government smoothly. And if it comes to it, the, the RSS, the BJP, other leaders in the BJP would not like to sacrifice their government, you know, NDA for the sake of one or two individuals. Probably they might, you know, ask, ask Mr. Modi and Mr. Shaw to gracefully quit. If that is if that is impending, if the, when that is coming, then Mr. Modi might himself feel that you know uh, uh, his way is he's not able to get his way. So he might announce some very drastic measure, and allies and other people might disagree, and then he would uh, you know dissolve the Lok Sabha, go to the people and say, look, I want to do this, but you know the, I'm not allowed because I don't have strength. You have to give me strength. So therefore, I also feel that the 18th Lok Sabha. Its longevity is in question. I do not think, I do not see a possibility of 18th Lok Sabha running its full course. So, therefore, I feel that, you know, it's difficult for the Modi government to pass the flow test. If at all it passes, it will be very bumpy, right? They have to mobilize all resources to do that. And then th there could be an alternative uh, leadership from within BJP to head the NDA. And there is also a possibility of Mr. Modi dissolving the Lok Sabha and going for fresh elections. And therefore, 18th Lok Sabha may not run its full course. These are my, uh, you know, uh, uh, prognosis. Okay. You have spoken extensively on, uh, like the book says, these are the essays on Republican crisis. My penultimate question to you is a very quick answer. I need a very quick answer for all those people who are watching this podcast. How do we make this republic stronger? How do we make this democracy stronger? Uh, okay. fr fr from a very narrow, very very narrow point of view. Okay. Um, you see, um, my argument is very simple. The There is an army which is working relentlessly against the values of the republic. It's, it's communal, it's divisive, it's hateful. 
you know, uh, it's against uh, federalism, against, you know, all the values that we stand for. Now, my question is, is there an army which is working to defend the, defend the uh, liberal values of the constitutional values against the communal values? So that is the main question today. So in order to avoid this crisis and get the Republic out of this crisis, you need a civil society movement. And I'm very sure that, you know, this is not possible with the uh, political parties. It's a civil society. We need an army from the civil society to defend the constitutional values. Only then will we get out of this crisis. And that can actually act as a pawn and become a queen or king maybe someday. So, my, my last question to you is, a very uh, on a lighter note, your Twitter bio says that you are a chess player. Also, you are a music lover. What are you listening to these days? What are you hooked on to these days? So I, I listen to everything, all genres, wow. grammatically. Hindustani I listen, Sufi I listen, Western I listen, uh, uh, African I listen, wow. you know, I listen to uh, uh, South American music. Um, and I also uh, play a bit of uh, flute. I've been learning flute for some time. Wow. I do all this. You know, oh, you, since you asked me recently, what are you listening to? I, I'm li listening to last two days I've been listening to, I'm, I'm fascinated by the voice. I'm listening to uh, Badar Mudasir. Oh, wow. I don't know if you heard him. I, I um, have, I'll surely. So, the only thing common between both of us is the taste of music. I listen to every possible genre available on this planet. He, he spells his name as B A B A R R, I think. Okay. Bab. Babar Mudasir. Mudasir. Okay. Mudasir. M U D A C E R. Okay. What a lovely voice. Wonderful oh. voice. It's a Sufi voice, but excellent voice. Listen to it. Sure, I'll surely do that. On that note, Dr. Prabhakar, thank you for taking your time and speaking to me. It was lovely having this chat with you. I hope to do this sometime in the future as well and hope to meet you sometime in person and have a long conversation around our democracy and republic. Thank you very much for having this conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Nice talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. When I come to Delhi, I'll let you know. We'll meet okay. up. For sure. I play guitar. I also play ukulele. We'll surely jam on a flute well. and a guitar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well.